My name is Harry Oosthuis. I'm an assistant professor at the Radboud University in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, today I'm going to talk about counterfactual estimation, specifically for uh, learning from user interactions with, uh, with rankings. Uh, this talk is based on a recent paper that I uh, published in uh, the, uh, the journal uh, that we usually call TOYS, Transactions on Information Systems. Um, it is available, um, it's open access, so you can find it on my website as well. Uh, there is also the code for it on the slides. Um, and at some point there will be a video recording of this talk there as well. Uh, I'll show this again at the end, because hopefully at the end you would be interested in reading it uh, if I did my job well. Um, the This talk um, is uh, divided in two parts. So to start with, I'm going to talk about counterfactual estimation in general. And the reason I want to do this is I want to, to uh, contrast it with how it ha what's happening in the learning to rank setting. Um, and I can't really do that if I haven't talked about both. Um, that does mean I, uh, I'm i making my life a little bit more difficult because now I have to talk about both of these. Uh, but that uh, the idea is that you give a nice uh, idea of both how it's done in general and in learning to rank. And by contrasting it, you can see sort of the uh, unique difficulties that we have in the ranking setting. All right, so uh, let's get started. So I'm gonna start with a very simple setting that has nothing to do with uh, ranking because we're just recommending single items. Uh, so an action here just looks like recommending a single item. It's the most simple setting, right? So at each time step, we have a user, we can show it one item, and then our goal is to maximize the total number of user interactions with this item. So I'm assuming here an interaction is something positive, like uh, watching a video, uh, uh, buying a product, giving a like, or uh, uh, reading something. Um, what, something that we want to maximize, so we want more of. Uh, but uh, we only have interaction data logged from a production system policy. So we have already a system running that gives us some interaction data, and we want to use that data to find the best policy for the future. Uh, so the real underlying question here is how do we evaluate a new policy based on data gathered by another? Um, and the evaluation and learning question is, uh, I treat them kind of similarly because they both have this, the same uh, problem here. So you can also think about how to optimize a new policy based on data gathered by another. If I visualize that, um, it looks something like this, right? So if we think about the evaluation side, uh, so I have my interaction data. So for instance, I have an interaction of a user that interacted with item B. Then I have on the right, I have my new policy that I want to evaluate. And I see how likely it is to, uh, how probable it is to recommend all these items. It's a probabilistic policy. Um, and then, well, the most straightforward idea is of course, well, if the person interacted with B, then B is a good recommendation. So we want to sort of maximize B. So the B probability sh should be higher um, the higher, the better, basically. Uh, and now I can do this with all the interactions in my interaction data. And at first glance, this seems totally reasonable, very straightforward. Uh, but there's an important problem here. That's why we call it the naive approach. And that's, uh, I'm ignoring how the interaction data was created here. Uh, more specifically, if I were to think about the whole process, we actually had the following, right? We had a logging policy. We had the production system choose an action, in this case, action B, that action was presented to the user, the user then could have interacted or not. And then um, I'm using that observation of whether it interacted or not to evaluate my new policy. The problem here is that if the logging policy, uh, well, basically the logging policy gets to decide which items we, we see in our data set. So in this setting, B is very much overrepresented. We see a lot of Bs, uh, recommendations here, where um, if my new policy happens to have a small uh, probability here, it now has a disadvantage, because most of the data sets are going to represent uh, an action that it just doesn't take very often. So a lot of the interactions there yeah, uh, um, will, will be downplayed. Um, so uh, this is basically a form of selection bias, right? The logging policy selects what part of the data we see. And it can make the selection in such a way that makes the new policy look better or worse, um, but not 
like it, it looks better or worse, but it isn't actually better or worse. This is so it's a form of bias. Um, if we exp if we write that down mathematically, uh, we can do it as follows. So here, um, I I this is what I call the expected reward. So uh, we have a reward function of our policy pi here. X is the context, so it's just contextual uh, data that could be, for instance, uh, what type of user you have or, or what you know time of day or whatever context you need. Then for each action, so we we're summing over each action, how likely is um, the new policy to recommend that item? And what's the probability of an interaction with that item? So this is what I would like to know, right? So this is uh, what I'm trying to maximize, uh, the expected reward. Um, of course, I don't know this, right? I particularly, I don't know the probability of an interaction with an item. Uh, if we knew that, then our lives would have been much easier. We don't know how likely people are to interact with each item. What we've done with the naive approach is we've taken the data set. So we had a data set of n interactions. And uh, to mimic this expected reward, we're basically replacing this probability with the observed interaction. So I'm, I'm averaging over all my uh, data points. And I'm taking, again, the probability that the new policy will would make the same recommendation and then whether there was an interaction with that observation or not. It looks, well, it looks very similar. If we actually look at the expected value, um, we see the problem here is this logging policy. So whether uh, an action occurs in the data set at all is determined by the logging policy. So the logging policy has made this change. And uh, this is where the, the, the bias comes from. So what I've done here is I've taken the uh, naive estimator uh, take the expectation of it, uh, that means the expectation over the, the context, uh, the actions and the clicks. And what comes out of that is something that looks very much like the expected reward, except now we have this logging policy probability in here. And this is not what we want, right? Because the, uh, the logging policy shouldn't change what we think about the new policy, right? There are different policies. Uh, we don't want this effect here. And we can see that it basically uh, gives a higher weight uh, to items that the logging policy also recommends and a lower way to those that it doesn't recommend. So it's affecting uh, our evaluation in a way that we we don't want at all. Right, so this is um, a, a very, uh, the problem of selection bias. So it's very well known. You see it in very different contexts and uh, counterfactual estimation is uh, a way to, to deal with this. So the usual way that we uh, go about it, the most basic way, is through inverse propensity scoring. And the idea of the inverse propensity scoring is that what we would like is the logging policy to be completely uniform. If, if all actions have the same probability under the logging policy, uh, we don't have this over or under representation. All items are treated equally. Um, however, that's not how the data was generated. So we can't change the data generation procedure. That's too late. But what we can do is give different weights to each observation. So the idea is that you take the logging policy probabilities and you inverse them. So you take um, one divided by the probability, and then we get these inverse propensities. Um, and the idea is that if you multiply the inverse propensities with the logging policy propensities, you have a uniform distribution. All, everything gets the, the weight of one. So that means that, for instance, item B here has a very high probability on the left, gets a really low probability in the inverse. Vice versa, item C here has very low probability on the logging policy, but a very high inverse propensity so that they cancel each other out. Then instead of taking the observed interaction and matching it with the new policy directly, I'm going to weigh it first by the inverse propensity. So in this case, because item B is overrepresented, I'm going to give it a very small weight so that it, it doesn't affect my evaluation very much. And the idea is that this small weight cancel out, out the overrepresentation in expectation. So if we were to look at that uh, mathematically, the IPS estimator um, is very similar to the naive estimator. We take, again, the, the policy uh, probability of the new policy, uh, um, the observed interaction, but now we divide it as, by the probability of the under the logging policy. So what we really have here is the ratio between the logging policy and the new policy. If I were to calculate the expectation here, we now see that we end up with the expected reward. If you remember, uh, this is what the expected reward looks like, right? Sum over every action, 
How likely is the action to be recommended by the new policy? How likely is it to be interacted with? Um, if you think about it, if you think about the previous pro uh, proof, right? What I've basically done if I, is I've divided the, the logging policy probability away. Um, so this is unbiased in the sense that if you take the expected value, it's what uh, it's the value that we want to estimate. So it's unbiased in the statistical sense. The problem is it suffers from very high variance. If these propensities are very small, you're giving a really large weight to a single observation. Uh, that means you're amplifying the noise from that single observation in your process as well. Um, so we solve the bias problem here, but we have a high variance problem. Another solution is what we call the direct method. And this is on the other end. So here we're going to see that we, we solve the variance problem, but we still have a bias problem. The idea is that you have some sort of regression model. So you have some sort of model that, given the features of an item or given some other information, gives you an estimate of how uh, good the item is, how likely it is to be interacted with. Um, it doesn't matter for the direct method what this actually is. So I represent it here with a magic wand. Um, that's I don't so uh, I don't mean that the model is magic or the model is something weird, but it might as well be. So we we really don't know what it is. Um, for the direct method, is it's agnostic to that. So um, whether this is your large language model or your uh, frequency estimate doesn't really matter. Um, it's as long as it's a regression uh, prediction. So we'll, we'll use our regressor uh, now for each item to predict what the click probability is. And because it's a regressor, we can do it for all of the items, right? We we uh, we can just give the features of all of the items. We have a number for each item. Uh, we don't have any form of selection here. And as a result, we can also link it to every uh, probability in the new policy. So we've completely solved the uh, selection problem. There's no longer any selection. But as you may notice, we have a different strange thing now is that we're ignoring any of the user interactions. So we've traded uh, We've traded the selection problem by ignoring the user interactions altogether. If I were to describe that mathematically, um, it will look like this, right? So now we have the estimate of the direct method. Uh, we're averaging over our n observations, but we're only going to use the context, as you can see here, not the actual interactions. Then for each action, how likely is the new pro uh, policy to recommend this item? And then what's the predicted interaction probably, probability? So um, again, this is the output of some sort of regression model that gives us an, an estimate here. Um, and the nice thing is we are we have no variance from interactions because we're ignoring the variance from inter we're ignoring interactions altogether, right? We um, variance is very small; it's not really a problem here. However, um, we are like we are almost certainly biased. We're only unbiased if these regression estimates, if these predicted interactions are always correct. Uh, but if they're always correct, then we've already solved the problem. And usually you don't try to solve problems that you've already solved. So in any sort of practical situation, you're going to be biased because you you will not be able to predict these, these interaction probabilities 100% correctly. Um, so what's really happened here is that we've traded all of our variance for bias but we don't really know how big that bias is. It really depends on the regression model, uh, so we're, which we are completely depending on right now. So this is the other extreme for IPS. Um, what we want, so the idea uh, of the, the paper is that we, we go in the middle. We go to what's called doubly robust estimation, where we try to take the both of best words. And the insight is, that the insight that the doubly robust, uh, underlying the doubly robust estimation method is, but if you have the direct, if you know the direct method, we know the direct method is biased, but we can actually estimate the, uh, we can correct for the bias of the doubly robust method with IPS. So we can start with uh, the direct method where we have our regression estimates and then use IPS to correct for that new form of bias. So we're basically uh, estimating the error of the direct method. Um, so I'll show that part here. Um, again, we use inverse propensity scoring because we're doing IPS again. Uh, but now instead of looking at the, just looking at the interaction, we look at what's the difference between the interaction that we observe and the, the uh, interaction probability that we predicted. 
So did we see an interaction versus what's the probability that we expected to see an interaction? And this tells us what the systematic, what, what the error is of our predictor, of our regression model. So we can use this to correct, correct for that error. And then we have to match it with the new policy uh, because again, it's still important. Uh, we, it's in the end what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to uh, see how good this policy is. Um, the, if formally speaking, that looks like this, right? So uh, the W bus estimator uh, starts with the direct method, starts with this regression-based estimation and adds an IPS estimator. Again, you may recognize the ratios between the propensities here. And, um, in, but instead of just looking at the interaction, we now have the interaction that we observed minus the predicted probability. What's going to happen in expectation is that the predicted part over here is going to cancel out the direct method in expectation. Um, so that gets rid of the bias of that, that part. Um, but of course, we don't have enough, usually have enough data to fully cancel that out. Uh, but we have less variance because if we are good at predicting where clicks occur, the value here is very small, which makes uh, the variance lower. Another way to think about this, so this is unusual, but it's going to be important later, is uh, you can think about this as a direct method plus the IPS uh, estimator minus a covariant. And then the covariant is basically uh, this second part over here, uh, multiplied by the IPS weights. Uh, this is going to be relevant in the ranking setting later. It's not how we usually think about the how do you, we usually approach the double robust estimator. Okay. So why is it called double robust? It's because it really uh, combines some properties of these two estimators in a very beneficial way. Uh, it's more easy to be unbiased here. So uh, we're unbiased if either the inverse propensity is correct. Uh, so this thing over here, which is what you need for IPS to be unbiased or if the regression estimate is correct. So if this probability over here is correct, we're also unbiased. And because it's an or relation, we uh, we are, so if you remember the regression estimate being correct is what we needed for the direct method, but now we can use either. And um, this or relation is per item. So for each item, we only need one and it can differ which one we have for the different items and we are unbiased. So that means that this is, when either IPS or the direct method is unbiased, the WS method is unbiased, but it can also be unbiased in other situations. So that's why we're more uh, robust, basically. The other interesting property is that we can decrease variance. So if you think about the variance of this equation, we basically have the variance of IPS plus the variance of the covariate minus the covariance between them. So if there's a high covariance between IPS and uh, the covariate, which is actually usually the case, um, or for, it's usually very easy to make that the case, um, we will have less variance as well. So it's easier to be unbiased and it's quite easy to get to be less, to have less variance than IPS. Uh, so in that way, we're combining sort of the properties of both. And this is why W bus estimation is so powerful. So I'll end here. So this is again, the overview of what it looks like in general. IPS, uh, we are reweighting according to logging policy probabilities or propensities. It's unbiased if these propensities are correct, but we have high variance, especially if there's low propensity actions. With the direct method, we purely use regression estimates, which is biased only unless your regression is 100% correct, but it's never the case. Uh, but we have very low variance because we're ignoring the observed interactions. Then the W bus estimation starts with the direct method and then uses IPS to correct for it. It's easier to be unbiased, and you have uh, lower variance than IPS if your regression is decent. So this is what it looks like in um, if you uh, in ge like general counterfactual estimation. For instance, if when it's applied to general um, reinforcement learning, uh, what we'll see is that um, up until uh, a couple like half a year ago, in the learning to rank uh, counterfactual learning to rank scene. Everything was based mostly about inverse propensity scoring. There's some work on the direct method, uh, but they didn't call it that. I don't think they realized this is what they were doing. Uh, but we were, we were completely missing W-bus estimation. Um, so for the next part of the presentation, I'm going to 
explain why I think it took so long that we with that we were dealing without any WS estimation here and how we can actually get it to work for the counterfactual learning to rank setting. All right. So that was a generic introduction. Now we can actually get, get into uh, the ranking setting. So the difference here, what I mean with the ranking setting is that um, when we make, when we show uh, the action of the system, so when we show recommendations or when we show search results, we're not showing one item, but we're showing a list of items. So uh, a ranking system takes, uh, has some items to choose from, but selects multiple and selects the ordering. Uh, the goal is still going to be to maximize the total number of interactions. I'm still assuming interactions are positive here, uh, but this is basically the basis for any search engine or uh, most recommendation systems as well. Um, of course, it's more difficult, right? Because we have more possible actions. And this is precisely what makes this setting very difficult. So we have a combinatorial problem here. Um, I've been working on this problem for uh, almost eight years at this point. And I'm still blown away by sort of this figure, which is the number of rankings that you can create uh, given the number of candidate items you have. So um, as you can see here, if we, you know, if we want to have um, how, how many items do you need so that you can make a million different top fives? Uh, well, it turns out you need 18 items and you already have more than a million possible top five rankings. If you want, uh, what is this, 100 million, uh, you need 42. So with 42 items, you can all already create more than a hundred million top five rankings. Um, I yeah, I'm still blown away every time I see these numbers. Uh, but what what's specifically worry worrisome here is that if we think about um, the propensity of each item, so, for, so not each item, so each ranking. So if we have a ranking system that is going to choose between these rankings uh, in a probabilistic way. The propensities are going to be extremely small because if you have to like you cannot choose between 100 million different options and not have some of them have a probability that's at least one in a hundred million or less and uh, if you remember the inverse propensity scoring but also wbus method used this uh, ips idea which doesn't work with very small propensities which means that we can't, can't just take the existing approach from reinforcement learning and apply it to ranking uh, because the variance explodes together with these uh, as these propensities get really, really small. So we, we basically have a variance problem due to these small propensities, which come from this combinatorial problem. Uh, luckily, there is a solution that's been developed uh, in about 2016, 2017, which is to focus on position bias instead of uh, action-based bias. And that's where we have our inverse propensity scoring specifically for ranking. So this idea, uh, the idea here is basically that instead of thinking about selection bias as which, which action was taken by the ranking policy, so which ranking did we show, we can also think about position bias as which items were actually seen by users. Um, so the very famous eye tracking studies, this is what I think used to be called the golden triangle uh, you see here on the right, which shows us that most people only look at the top two results. But if you go down to result number eight, you have less than 50% of people left. So it basically means whenever you show a ranking, about half of the people you show it to aren't even looking at the bottom of the ranking. Um, and this is a form of bias because um, you can gather more and more data. If you don't change the ranking, this effect stays the same. Right? So it's not a form of noise. This doesn't go away if you get more data. Um, now, the idea is going to be that instead of thinking about selection biases, which ranking did we show, we're going to think about it, how did position bias affect which items were observed? Um, to do that, we have to make some assumptions. So we have to make an assumption about uh, for any mathematics to work, you have to start with your, your base assumptions, right? In this case, we have to make a model uh, that brings out the relation between clicks and the quality of an item uh, in an invertible mathematical formula so that we can then create an estimator for it. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, a very basic model here, but it actually can capture a lot of uh, forms of bias, um, which is uh, the probability of a click. As you see here, based on the item D, that's D historically that used to be documents so that's why it's still 
called T. Uh, K is the position or rank, like in a top K ranking. And then uh, I'm going to use the probability of R, where R comes from relevant, but can also be preference, right? So it's the quality of an item. I'll, I'll probably just call it relevance for this talk. Um, so we have the, on the left hand, we have the probability of a click. On the right hand, we have the relevance of an item. And then these other two factors are um, the, what I call the bias parameters. So for each rank, we have a different level of correlation and trust. We'll start at the right side here. This beta is the trust. Uh, what we mean by that is, is how many people will click on an item, even if it's completely irrelevant. So it turns out that in a lot of uh, ranking settings, uh, people, for instance, trust a lot of the big search engines. So whatever you put on position one, people, some people are going to click on it. So that's captured by the beta parameter. That's the clicks you get for free, you might say. Um, and then on the right, on the left side, we have the alpha parameter that tells us, given how relevant you are, how many more clicks do you get? So, um, how big is the difference between in click rate between a not relevant item and a very relevant item? And uh, this, both of these are affected by position bias, right? So, in the places where no one, where very few people look, both of these values are going to be very small. Places where a lot of people look. The sum of these is going to be very small, but the ratio might uh, might differ. Um, so this is what we call, uh, I'm calling it here a position bias model. It's sometimes called a position bias and trust model, trust bias model. Doesn't really matter for this talk. Um, the property that I'm going to use later is that we can invert this formula. So if you want to get probability of uh, relevance, given the click probability, and if you know these bias parameters, what you can do is you take the click probability, you subtract the beta parameter. So you, you basically take away the clicks that it got for free. And then from the remaining clicks, you look at, uh, you divide it by alpha, the correlation between clicks and relevance. So that tells us um, basically how, uh, so on based on how many more clicks it gets, uh, this correlation can tell us how much more relevant it probably is. Um, so this, this model allows us to go from clicks to relevance and the other way around if we know the beta parameters. Um, in the original work on this topic, uh, let me actually go back for a second. The beta parameter is not used in this model. They only have an alpha parameter um, because they're only modeling position bias. Uh, the intuition there was basically that what we're going to do, uh, very similar to IPS, is we're going to use weighting to account for over or under representation. So in this example, the bottom item here, item H, we think only 40% of users actually look at this item. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the click to rate and we're going to multiply it by 2.5 to correct for that under representation. And the idea is that if you multiply by 2.5, it's as if 100% of people looked at it. So that's our estimate of what if everyone looked at the, the item. Vice versa, at the top of the ranking, so we have A and B here, uh, we think everyone looks at these items. So we just take the click to rate as is. We don't correct it in any way. Uh, so this was the idea of the original paper. Um, with trust bias, it's a little bit more complicated, but the same uh, is true here. Uh, what's important here is that we're basically doing IPS, but now instead of the propensities being based on the action, like what ranking is shown, it's based on the amount of exposure. and the values of exposure are much higher than those action probabilities. So instead of one in 100 million, we're still in the uh, tens or in the percentages, in the, uh, in the decimals, basically. So um, the propensities can still be small, but they're not going to be this extremely small where we don't have any chance to deal with the variance. Uh, so they're going to be much bigger than if we take the action propensities. And that's why, uh, why this still still works in the ranking setting. Um, all right, so let's uh, write that down mathematically. So I'm going to use propensities as uh, exposure is what we what it's sometimes called, uh, which in this model is the expected correlation. So I'm going to introduce rho here. Uh, rho for an item is just the expected alpha value under the logging policy. So what rankings is this item likely to be shown? And then what is the alpha value at those rankings? So I'm just summing over every rank. How probable is it to, to appear at that rank? And what's the correlation at that rank? So this is the expected correlation under the logging policy. Then uh, we can create our IPS estimator with trust bias corrections 
um, based on that inverse probability I've shown you before. So I'm going to estimate the relevance probability of the item as an average over all our observations uh, with this item. Uh, for each click, I'm subtracting the beta at that rank. So how many clicks I think it has gotten for free so far. And I'm going to divide that by this propensity. And um, it's the same idea as uh, standard IPS, but we're avoiding these really low propensities that because we're not basing on actions, but on exposure. And it's very easy to prove that this is unbiased. The only downside is that we now have to also know the alpha and beta parameters. So we have to know the bias parameters of the user model. There's actually a lot of work on how to estimate these. I'm not going to get into that for this talk, but you can use things like expectation maximization to figure out what these values probably are. Um, so basically, we can we avoid this low propensity problem. We can still be unbiased, but we now need to know a bit more about alpha and beta. Uh, so we need to know a bit more about the user behavior. But that's a small price to pay in order to be able to do counterfactual estimation. OK, uh, now, as I said before, this is basically where uh, the field was uh, let's say a, a half a year ago, a year ago, uh, most of the work where we could actually prove things was in this IPS uh, regime, regime. Knowing, of course, at the start that I uh, that we that Dolby Bus estimation exists, um, the first obvious question is why why haven't we seen that after um, about six years since this IPS method was introduced? Why haven't we seen any sort of Dolby Bus estimation? Uh, or W estimation based on exposure, just like we have for IPS. Uh, now it's hard to uh, to answer that question because I don't, you know, I don't know what other research were doing, why they didn't uh, think about this. Um, however, I have some idea. So I think uh, the biggest issue, what makes the the ranking problem different from most other settings, is that we're trying to estimate relevance, but we never actually observe relevance. We only observe clicks. And if you remember, the direct method needs regression of thing that we are estimating. But if we're estimating relevance, we, we never see relevance in these interaction logs. So it's hard to uh, train a regressor on it. Even worse for W robust estimation, you need to know the difference between the predicted relevance and the true relevance in, in your estimator. But we never observe the true relevance. So how do we know how wrong our predicted relevance is? Um, and this is why you can't just take um, the existing double robust method and apply it to uh, to the click setting in this exposure way like we could do with IPS. Um, so my hypothesis is that this is why uh, the field was stuck on IPS. And this is sort of the, the problem that we have to overcome. Um, so again, what we need to be able to do is to somehow know the difference between the predicted relevance and the true relevance. Um, and then uh, we, we might have a chance of getting Dolby Bus estimation to work. So uh, it turns out that for the direct method, actually other people already thought about this problem and uh, published on it, but maybe in a different setting. So this wasn't very well known, um, but uh, you can estimate a cross entropy loss. So a cross entropy loss is what you use, you use to optimize classification system or estimate probabilities in this case, um, using an alteration of IPS. So this is work from 2019. Um, they didn't really apply it to the learn to rank setting, but it, but it works. So the, I think these are the first people to do it. I did some minor alterations here, for instance, adding the beta parameter, uh, not very important. So it's, it's mainly work from uh, the people that you see at the bottom here. Um, and the first thing is, uh, so here on the left, right? So we, again, we, we are, using IPS, we have uh, one divided by our propensity. Now, in a cross entropy loss, you want the real value, the real probability times log the predicted probability to start with. So we have log the predicted probability over here, right? That's that's easy, but we want the real probability on the left. So what we can do actually is we can take the click minus the beta parameter. And then because we're dividing by the propensity, we have the IPS estimator here. And if you remember in expectation, this formula gives us the relevance. So in an expectation, this is going to be the probability of relevance uh, over here. And on the right, we want probability of not being relevant times the log probability of predicted probability of not being relevant, which is just one minus the other probability, of course. Uh, 
And uh, what you can do here actually is you can just do one minus this thing over here. Um, I altered that a little bit for uh, some reasons I don't want to get into now. Uh, but basically, uh, instead of one, we use alpha here. And uh, this gives us uh, the one minus the probability of relevance. Uh, what's interesting is that on the left, we have the difference between the observed click and the click probability if it's not relevant. On the right, we have the difference between the observed click and the click probability if it's 100% relevant. So on the left, we basically have how many more clicks do, do we see than if we were to expect the document not being relevant. On the right, we see how many how, how much fewer clicks do we see than if the document was completely relevant. And then these differences through the propensity score uh, weighing um, turn into these relevance differences. OK, uh, basically, long story short, we can because we can unbiasedly estimate cross entropy loss, we can optimize a regression model. And um, that means we can do unbiased regression of R based on clicks. So we can get a regressor that estimates relevance just based on clicks without ever having to observe relevance. All right. So that already brings us very far. So here's where sort of my, my novelty comes in, or where my work, of uh, uh, the thing I added comes uh, in this paper at least, is if we think about this uh, formulation that I showed you before, that I said was only relevant in the ranking sense, is that W robust estimation is the direct method plus the IPS estimator minus the covariate. And the insight here is that we're only missing this last part. So all, so all we need is a covariate, and then we can have this whole thing working. Um, if you remember the covariate, what we need is it needs to have the same expected value as the direct method, and we want a high covariance with IPS. So uh, this is what I uh, came up with. Um, it's, again, we have n observations. So for each document, we have, again, the propensity. And up here, uh, the alpha value at the position at which it was displayed. And then this is the regression estimate. So this is what our the probability that our regression estimate gives to this document being relevant. Uh, so what this actually turns out to be is the top part here is the correlation between clicks and relevance given the actual positions as which the item was displayed, the document was displayed. And the bottom is the expected correlation. So this is the expected correlation. You can think of it like if you were to have an infinite amount of data, and the top part is actually given the data that we have, what's the correlation that we saw there. In expectation, this alpha just turns into rho by definition. So this just turns into one. So an expectation is, is going to just be the direct method. So it's going to cancel that out. So that part is the easy part, right? So we can cancel out uh, the direct method, but what about the covariance? Oh, here, here's it again. So uh, just to repeat it once more, um, the expected alpha is just rho. So if we take the expectation here, the denominator and the denominator are going to have the same value. So it's just going to turn into the direct method, but only an expectation. So it's, it's not the direct method, but an expectation, they have the same value. Okay, now the covariance, it turns out that if you now complete the formula, right? If you do the direct method plus IPS minus the covariant, you end up with the following. Again, we start with the direct method. We start with our regression model. What does our regression model think of uh, the relevance probability? And then for each observation, we're again doing IPS. So we have one divided by our propensity here. Um, now we have the observation. So what's the, what's the observed interaction minus the, uh, or the click, I should say, minus the predicted click probability. Um, so, uh, so if you remember, the beta part was already there and the alpha part is just what I added with the covariate. So what we're doing here is we're looking at the difference between the click we observed and the click probability. So if we're very good at predicting where clicks take place, uh, they're going to, this is going to correlate very highly, and this is going to be close to zero most of the time, um, which means there's going to be low variance. Another way to think about what's happening here is we look at what is the click-to-rate that we observe, what's the click-to-rate that we predict given our regression estimate. And that difference, we can translate into relevance through this inverse propensity. Um, yes, all right. Um, okay, so what are the properties of this estimator? Unfortunately, I still need to know alpha and beta. So we still have the, we still uh, need to know enough about the user behavior to estimate these parameters. Uh, 
But for each item, we now either need the logging policy uh, propensities to be correct. So that's uh, knowledge about the logging policy, or we need the regression estimate to be correct. So I, or this value here needs to be correct. Again, uh, this is, it's unbiased when either the IPS, exposure-based IPS, or the exposure-based direct method are unbiased, but also in cases where neither are. So we're, we are more unbiased more often. Um, and I also think that this is the first, it's hard to check this claim, but I think this is the first robust estimator where we don't need to directly observe the, the errors. Uh, but this is hard, it's hard to verify. So I'm not entirely sure about that claim. We can also prove uh, that we have less bias or equal bias and variance in IPS. So basically, if even if these alpha and beta values are, um, so even if we don't know the logging policy probabilities, um, we, we're still having less bias and variance uh, than, I, uh, than IPS. So we do need to know alpha and beta, but if the regression errors are in uh, this range that you see on screen here, so between zero and twice the true relevance, we have less bias or variance. So that means it's very easy to be less biased and have less variance. Okay, uh, I'll skip that. Um, so for the sake of time, I'll, I want to give you some intuition and then I'll show you some experimental results before we wrap up. Um, so I've gone through a lot of mathematics here and I might have lost you on the way because it's quite a lot. And, um, uh, and even if you followed me so far, I do want to give you an idea of the intuition behind this method. So like what's what's going on, what, what's, what's really, so this is a way to think about the method. It's not 100% correct. The mathematics is what's, what's really happening, of course, but uh, it gives you some idea of why it works so well or a way to think about it that's almost correct. So an intuitive way. Um, in inverse propensity scoring, um, if there are items that are never displayed during logging, they never were able to receive a click and an IPS estimates the relevance to be zero. So we know they're going to end up at the bottom of the ranking. So really, if you use interactions, you can only really re-rank the top of the uh, items. Of course, if you train a feature-based model, uh, it might behave differently on a different data set. But if we're just following uh, the relevance estimates, uh, IPS is only recommending a re-ranking of the top of the, of the rankings that were displayed to users not to items that were never displayed during logging. So if there are items that never were seen by any users, they're going to remain at the bottom. Um, these items were in fact unlucky. Um, on the other hand, the direct method doesn't have this problem, right? It, because we're estimating a relevance estimate for all of the items, we can re-rank everything we want, but because it ignores interactions, um, we might, it, it's, there, might, there are probably mistakes in here. The idea of the Dolibus method, is sort of, again, this is an approximation, is that you start with the direct method. So you start with your regression model. You think about how should I re-rank my items? And then you use clicks at the end to then correct for these once again. So that means that now all the items can be moved around, um, but we're still using both interactions and regression estimates. Um, and I think this is really where the power comes from. Um, so, okay. So let me show you. Uh, here we are. Um, so um, the experiments for this paper are based on simulations uh, because we I don't have a real search engine. And um, in simulations, we can actually have control over the bias and we can see exactly what's happening. Um, so these are to give an idea of how efficient these methods are. So um, I'm not claiming that the simulation is extremely realistic. Uh, but it's usually the conclusions from the simulation in terms of efficiency translate to real world settings. Um, if you, you know, the, you have to look at researchers in industry to really see these, these, uh, these types of results. I'm limited to simulations, but uh, that's uh, normal in this type of field. What we do is we take commercial search engine data sets where there's relevant judgments, and then we simulate clicks with position bias and noise on top of these judgments. And then um, using that simulated bias data, we can learn a model that we can then uh, evaluate on the original relevance judgments once again. So we add our own bias and then we see how good we can correct for it. I'll start with a top five setting. So the bias here is unknown. So there's an extra step at the start that estimates the bias parameters. So we don't have any information that you wouldn't have in, in a real world scenario. Um, and it's a top five setting. So we can only show top uh, five items at a time. 
Uh, the bottom here is the production system performance. The top here is performance if you use the actual label. So this is the upper bound. This is the best performance possible in this data set. And this is where we start. Uh, this is, by the way, Yahoo Web Scope. Some of you might know it. Uh, this is if you ignore the effective bias. So if you ignore the effective bias, you get stuck at a certain level of performance. And even if you go from 100,000 queries to um, a billion queries in your day, in your interaction log, you're no, you don't get any improvement uh, there. Uh, the screen line is inverse propensity scoring. As you can see, it does better than naive approach. We can prove it's unbiased, but the amount of data it needs is so big that we never get to go to optimal performance within a billion queries. Uh, so that's a big problem because a billion queries is already uh, a very, very large amount of, of data. Um, the reason is variance, right? We know it's unbiased here, but um, it's, yeah, the variance is stopping it because it needs so much uh, more data to get rid of the variance uh, that it, yeah, it's stuck. The direct method, this is blue line, uh, we see this much better. So here the regression model was trained on this interaction data as well. So the more data, the better it gets. Um, and this already a big improvement over RPS. And then the W robust method improves over that even more. And what's important now is that if you look at the performance of IPS on the right here, and we go to the left to see when W robust estimation reaches that level of performance, then we see that we need a thousand times less data or actually almost uh, uh, more than a thousand times less. I don't know the exact value here. Um, that's enormous, right? It's not normal. It's something we normally see, even in these uh, in these type of simulations. That's an enormous difference, uh, and that's how powerful. Um, well, basically, the direct method is right because the direct method did most of this improvement. But then the WBUST method improves over it even more. Uh, so that's a really big change. Uh, that's more than you usually see in these type of experiments. This is on the MSLR Web 30 uh, k data set. Same pattern, um, again, more, more than a thousand times uh, efficiency increase. Uh, this is only Stella. This one is interesting. For some reason, uh, regression and IPS have about the same performance, but the W robust method, again, has this thousand time uh, improvement over IPS. Uh, it seems to be that because the direct method and the IPS method make different types of mistakes, that by combining them, you can do better than both. Um, so that's a good sign. So in, in all these cases, the WS method was the best uh, choice. Uh, in a full ranking setting, so this is not a top five setting where we show the entire ranking. So in theory, a user could scroll all the way to the bottom. Uh, in this setting, IPS does much better. As you can see, it reaches optimal performance um, after 10 million queries. Uh, and the direct method gets stuck earlier. So it's apparently it's very hard to do a cross entropy uh, loss estimate with these very small propensities at the bottom of the list. And uh, the WBUST uh, method here uh, does almost perfectly kind of a maximum operation between the two. So it's uh, when one when the direct method is better than IPS, it's it's closer to that performance. When IPS is better than the direct method, it falls that performance. So again, it's combining the best of both worlds here. And we see the same or similar results on Web30K and Stella. Um, so uh, here, the performance gains are, I mean, depending on where you look. So in some places, they are quite big. At the end, they are all the same. They all converge at the, at the same level in, on this data set, for instance. Um, right. Um, let's see. For the sake of time, I'll briefly mention we also tested incorrect bias settings. So if the alpha and beta parameters are wrong, uh, it turns out that even in those situations, the Dolly Bus method uh, appears to, to be significantly uh, better, so it has significantly higher performance. So even in cases where, like we we make some very extreme mistakes in bias estimation, the W robust method is more robust and and does perform better there. Um, yes. Okay. So uh, to wrap up, uh, we went to quite quite a lot. Thank you for for sticking with me. Right. Um, what I would like you to take away from this tutorial is first of all, uh, position bias affects interactions with rankings. And it will disrupt your optimization. So if you're working with interaction data, bear in mind that there are these other effects of position bias. Um, you can also take this conclusion as if you're working with data that has selection bias, uh, that's probably something that you want to take care of. Um, of course, here in this talk, I focus on, focus on position bias. The existing solution for this problem used to be adverse propensity scoring based on exposure. If you remember, we, we use exposure instead of these action-based propensities that you use in 
sort of general counterfactual estimation, because they're higher values and they avoid these extreme uh, variance problems. In this paper, I contributed uh, the first exposure-based dual robust estimation method that we can apply for learning to rank, to a learning to rank. Um, and we can prove that it has less bias and variance if you have decent regression, and decent regression is usually actually fairly easy to achieve. Um, in the experimental results, we had some extreme improvements. So in the top five setting, we have more than a thousand times data efficiency uh, over IPS. Um, yeah, that's, again, uh, I did not expect such an enormous difference, but I'm very happy we found it. Um, I don't know how this translates to real world settings, uh, even though IPS has seen success there already. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be a thousand times uh, improvement as well, uh, but I'm fairly confident it's going to be a, a, a significant change there as well, uh, or the, that's what I would expect. Um, what this means is that now we have state-of-the-art counterfactual estimation for counterfactual learning to rank. So if you remember at the start, I pointed out this difference, right, where uh, in, in, in generic counterfactual estimation, we had three different methods, but in uh, learning to rank, we only really had one. That's no longer the case. We we now have sort of the best from the generic setting applicable in the learning to rank setting. Uh, so I think for the field, that's really important because it also opens a lot of doors uh, and we're more aligned with machine learning in general. Um, here's the link to the to the paper again. Um, uh, I can, you know, if you Google the title, you can also find it or if you Google my name. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention.